Ill. Let's take our Bibles tonight. We're going to start something new. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 7. 1 Samuel chapter 7. And we are going to take a few lessons and we are going to look at King Saul. Okay, we are going to look at the life of King Saul. His story begins for us here in 1 Samuel um, chapters 8 and 9. We're going to read a couple verses from chapter 7 as we begin. But what we'll do tonight is really just kind of look at the introductory information that the Bible gives us. We're going to kind of set the scene. We're going to set the background for what allows a king to, to arise in Israel. I think everybody's familiar pretty much with 1 Samuel chapter 18. But in looking at that, or 1 Samuel chapter 8, excuse me. Um, but we'll look tonight at some of the background that spurred those events and what the Bible has to say about those. So tonight we're kind of doing the background, the introductory information, uh, but a lot of lessons that we're going to be able to see and learn from the life of King Saul, uh, a man who was risen to great privilege, right? Kind of out of nowhere. Israel never had a king before, um, before Saul became king of Israel, and yet... Saul very much wasted his privilege and his place as king. Uh, when David arises in the hearts of the Lord's people, Saul spends a whole bunch of his kingdom, a whole bunch of his time as king, um, just, just wastefully. Um, does some good things, does some bad things. But from all these things, we're going to be able to learn some lessons from him. So let's look tonight in an introduction to King Saul, and let's kind of start with this first thought and look, cover the background, okay? 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 15. 1 Samuel 7, verse 15. It says, And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, and he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel, and Gilgal, and Mizpah, and judged Israel in all those places. And his return was to Ramah, for there was his house, and there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar unto the Lord. By way of background, we would remind us that Israel is what we would like to call a theocracy. Okay, At this time, Israel is what we would call a theocracy. Now, we know what a democracy is, right? That, that's the will and the rule of the, the people. We know what a monarchy is. That's the rule uh, and law of a king. What, what is a theocracy? Well, that is a rule. Uh, theos, theology, right? That's talking about God. A theocracy is a place where God is king and where God's word is the law. So that's what Israel was at this time. Israel is what we would call a theocracy. God was their king. There had not been a king in Israel prior to this. And it's actually fair to say that God's word or God's law was the law of the land. Now, it's kind of hard for us to imagine, right? Because we have a law of the land, right? We have a constitution that's the over, overall structure, the overall law of the land. And then, of course, each state has their own laws, each, you know, counties and cities and all those things. We kind of understand our system of law. But in the Old Testament... The way that Israel was in the land of Israel at this time, God's word was their law. What do I mean by that? Well, when we read in the book of Exodus, when we hear the term law, we think of Exodus chapter 20, right? We think of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt have no any graven images. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath. Honor father and mother. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Don't bear false witness. Don't covet. All of those things, we think, well, that's God's law. And that is, that, that, is, that is God's law. That is the overarching theme of God's law. The, the, the morality of God's law and the reflection of His character is seen in that. And yet in Exodus chapters 21, 22, and 23, um, the Bible says this, actually. I'm not going to read the entire thing. It's, it's three different chapters. But let me just read you this first verse. Exodus 21, verse 1 says, Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. 
And Exodus 21, 22, 23 actually details laws by which the children of Israel were to live by as a people, as a nation. It's what we would call the law of the land, right? So if you think about the Constitution for the United States, think about Exodus 21, 22, 23 for the children of Israel. There are laws in there that deal with laws of property, laws of crime, laws of justice, laws of the, the, the Sabbaths, right? Now, you know, the Sabbath day is, is, was God's law, God's really overarching moral law. God's intent is that man have one day in seven to rest, right? That, that God blessed the Sabbath day, he hallowed it, God rested on the seventh day, and he gave the model that men do the same. But there's actually more than that that is in the Sabbath day. It was actually the law of the land of Israel. Did you know that if you had property and you had land and you had servants and you had cattle and you had animals, it was the law in Israel that you had to give them the Sabbath of rest. Uh, it's, it's not just that this is what God says is morally right and wrong. This was also the law. This was the law that governed the children of Israel. And those rules governed Israel, and they were what you would call a theocracy. When Israel conquered the land of, uh, of Canaan, they were led by a faithful hero, right? We, we took some time. It's been a couple of years now, but we went through Joshua, the story of Joshua. Joshua was a faithful hero to the children of Israel, and he led them into the land of promise, and he helped them conquer that land. When he died... Israel was left with the responsibility to finish the job. Okay, I'm covering a whole lot of history here. Joshua chapter 24, he dies. Israel is in the land and they have a responsibility. Once Joshua dies, they are supposed to drive out the inhabitants of the land, aren't they? They are supposed to settle and occupy that entire land. He had given them victory. And Israel was there in pockets throughout the land of promise, and their land had been allotted to them, but they had not yet driven out the Canaanites. They had not yet driven out the inhabitants of the land. They were supposed to do that after Joshua died. Well, after Joshua died, there was really a vacuum of good leadership. Israel failed in driving out the inhabitants of the land. We read that in Judges chapter 1 last week. There are at least seven different tribes that are mentioned in Judges chapter 1 as failing. Um, if there's only 12 tribes, seven means that's more than half failed to drive out all the inhabitants of their land. And see, what happened then is that put Israel in a precarious spot because they did not drive out the inhabitants of the land. Those inhabitants of the land impacted them. Israel began to, to fall into idolatry, false worship. And that leads to the vicious cycle that we've talked about in the, in the book of Judges, where they fall into idolatry and they fall into sin, and God sends them um, someone to judge them and someone to punish them. A foreign, a foreign nation or someone from the Moabites or the Canaanites rises up and oppresses them. In their oppression, they call out to God, they pray, they repent. God sends them a deliverer, a person called a judge. That's why it's called judges. And he spares them, things get better for a while, and then they start that cycle all over again. And the book of Judges details that all of those different cycles. It gets to the end of Judges and it says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everybody did that which was right in his own eyes. That's the theme through Judges and into the book of Samuel. Samuel is what we would call the last of the Judges, okay? 1 Samuel chapter 7, that was our text. 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 15, Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. That tells you where he did that and kind of how he did that. Joshua, or I'm sorry, um, Samuel made the rounds. Right? He'd go from place to place. It says in verse 16, he went from year to year, um, circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah, and he judged Israel in all those places, and then he'd go home. His return was to Ramah. There was his house, and there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar. Samuel kind of stands as the last of the judges. So the, the book of Judges spans from the end of Joshua's life 
to uh, really toward the end of the period of the judges, and Samuel kind of stands as the last of those. Now, chapter 8 opens. That, that's, that's the background, okay? That's the introductory information. That's all the background that leads us to the, to the life of Samuel and 1 first, first Samuel chapter 8, where Israel has a desire for a king, okay? That's our next thought, our next point, Israel and a king. Now, this chapter is familiar to us. We know about 1 Samuel chapter 8 because it outlines their request for a king. 1 Samuel chapter 8 details Israel's request for a king. Now, I'm going to give you three things that precipitate Israel's call for a king. Okay? There's three things that Israel notes plainly in their desire for a king. Okay? The first one is this is the downfall of Samuel's family, okay? The downfall of integrity within Samuel's family. Now, let's look here. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now, the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. But his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, took bribes, perverted judgment. Boy, that's exactly what Exodus had told them not to do, right? A gift blindeth the eyes, the Bible tells us. A gift perverts judgment, perverts justice, right? Boy, it'd be sad to think that judges in our country were, you know, were taking bribes. Wouldn't it be sad to think that there were politicians that were taking bribes? It happens, right? But it was, it's wrong now. It was wrong then. And see, Israel knew it was wrong then. Look at verse number four. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and to Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now, whatever you think of Samuel... People could look and see that once Samuel tried to appoint his sons to leadership, people were like, no, 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 we're not having this. Samuel's, Samuel's old, and he's kind of tried to appoint the next round of leadership, but these guys aren't like Samuel. And they were able to look at Samuel's sons, and these guys take bribes, and these guys pervert judgment and justice. And they said, Samuel, sorry, and we know you're old, but... Uh, we're not going to have these guys to rule over us. You need to make us a king. So there was a downfall of integrity within Samuel's family. You and I would look at Samuel and think that for the most part, the Bible records a lot of good detail about Samuel. Um, but Samuel's sons didn't walk in his ways. Samuel's sons weren't great guys. They weren't good men. Now, Samuel had seen that before, hadn't he? The Bible talks about um, Samuel's mentor. You guys remember who that was? Eli, right? Early in the book of 1 Samuel, Hannah brings Samuel to Eli, and he gives she, or excuse me, she gives Samuel over to the Lord's service, and there um, Samuel begins to learn and tutor and be mentored by Eli. And here's what he also sees in 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Samuel is there when the Bible records for us this information that 1 Samuel 2 verse 12, Now the sons of Eli were the sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. It talks about the things that they would do, and it talks about how they were abusive in the priesthood. It talks about how they were abusive to people that would bring their offerings and would bring their sacrifices and how they would take more than their portion and how they would threaten that they would not sacrifice for people. And they, they were just really, really evil men. They knew not the Lord. And it says in 1 Samuel 2, verse 17, Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Now let's jump down to verse 27, 1 Samuel 2, verse 27. And there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, 
Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever, but now the Lord saith, Be it far from me, for them that honor me will I honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And the rest of this chapter goes on to detail God's promise to Eli that a uh, Buddy, your family's done, okay? I'm not going to use your house anymore. And, and there's pretty explicit language that's given there about the things that are going to happen to, um, to the descendants of Eli. And we read about some of those things later on in 1 Samuel. <coughs> Point is this. Samuel's kind of seen this before, right? When the guy that's in charge has evil sons and he doesn't do anything about that, it doesn't work out very well. You come over to 1 Samuel chapter 8 and you kind of see the same thing in Samuel, that his sons aren't good men. And they're not really the kind of people that should be put in charge. They're not really the kind of people that should be judges in Israel. Samuel did, right? Um, he, I'm sure he loved his sons. Um, I'm sure that he hoped that they would do better. Um, this is not personally an indictment upon Eli, I, I'm sure he thought, or, or Samuel, I'm sure that he hoped and trusted for the best for his sons and that they would do right, but they didn't. And when the people came to Samuel, they said, look, buddy, sorry, um, we can't do this anymore. You got to give us a king. So that's the first thing, right? That's the first thing that precipitated. Um, the people could see it. Just remember, guys, people are watching you. Right? Always remember that. And you got to try to do what's right. You really, we should do what's right for right's sake. We should do what's right because we love the Lord and because we want to serve Him. But it's okay to remember in the back of your mind that, you know, part of the, a good motive for doing right, too, is people are watching. People would love to see, uh, see you slip up and falter. Okay? Don't give them the satisfaction of that. You keep faithful, keep doing what's right. The second thing that precipitated, of course, the downfall of Samuel's family. But the second thing the Bible notes is that the children of Israel wanted to be like all the other nations. Now, it's mentioned twice in this chapter. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse number 5, they say this. 1 Samuel 8, verse 5, Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. 1 Samuel 8, this same chapter, verse 20. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 20, it says that we also may be like all the nations. Okay? Children of Israel were able to look around and see the surrounding nations, see the surrounding peoples, and that they had a king. They had a centralized focus of power and authority. And, you know, is there a, is there a degree where they, they kind of tired of this concept of, you know, Samuel... You know, Samuel's a good guy and Samuel's a, a leader, but, you know, from year to year, you know, he's, he, he, he's always on the move and he's going from this place to this place and this place. Wouldn't it be nice to just be like all these other nations and just have one seat of power, one seat of authority, one man that could be king and could rule us like all the other nations, okay? Part of their desire for a king is not that, that they... Um, it's not a godly desire. It's not because they looked in the law and found that this, this was really the best path. It's because they looked around and they saw this is what everyone else is doing. And so they, they kind of wanted that too. The third thing that precipitated this, the history of the nation of Israel and the time of judges is one of constant battle, right? Being overcome by an enemy and then having a judge that helps them overcome. And being overcome by an enemy and then having a judge that helps them overcome. Israel wants someone that can fight for them. They want a king that they can focus their, um, you know, 
their strength on and their might on and one that will lead them in battle and in victory. It's what it says in 1 Samuel 8, verse 20. 1 Samuel 8, verse 20, that we may also be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. We need, we need someone to fight for us. You know, that's a far cry from the days when men like Joshua were trusting the Lord for victory, wasn't it? Joshua would tell people, come on, let's go. The Lord, the Lord will give us victory. The Lord is going to give us his promises. And now the children of Israel, they've totally lost focus on that, right? There's an episode in 1 Samuel where they've become so superstitious that they go and grab the Ark of the Covenant thinking that, that it's like a good luck charm, that it's like a, a, a medallion or this magic box that's going to lead them to victory against the Philistines. Read chapter 4 and remember how that turns out. It doesn't work out that way. What happened to the days where they trusted the Lord? Now They're trusting the ark, and now they want a king that they can look to as their leader and the one that will lead them in battle. Joshua always looked to the Lord for those things. He always prayed. He sought guidance. He sought strength and help from the Lord. We don't have a lot of... Israel just doesn't bear the same look that it did when guys like Moses and Joshua were in charge, does it? So those are the things that precipitate Israel's call for a king. So it tells us there in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 5, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Israel wants a king. Let's get into this, this third section here now where there's some words of warning. Okay? Words of warning. In verse number 6, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 6, it says that the thing displeased Samuel. And I know you're going to think, well, that's self-serving, right? Because who's the guy in charge? Samuel is. Well, of course it displeases him when they want somebody else to lead them. I, I, I get it. I get what you're thinking there. Uh, and maybe there is an element to that. But notice here, when they said, give us a king to judge us, and Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Now, God confirms that they are rejecting him. Now, what, what does that mean? God was their king, right? Israel, I started off with that in the introduction. Israel was a theocracy. What does God say? They have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Now, look over in chapter 12 real quick. 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 12, and it kind of says the same thing. 1 Samuel 12, Samuel's rehearsing the things that God had done for them. And yet here in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 12, it says, When ye saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you, ye said unto me, Nay, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was king. Right? The Lord your God was king. God makes it clear to Samuel, they haven't really rejected you. This really is a rejection of me. God was their king. So when they say, well, give us a king, they already had a king. That wasn't the king that they wanted, right? They didn't want God to be their king. They wanted another man to be their king. They wanted a king that could lead them into battle. Hadn't God led them into battle? See, they, they, all, all the things that they seem like they want, God should have been for them. But that wasn't, they weren't satisfied with that, right? Now, we need to, make, we need to harmonize something here. Because this passage tells us God's displeasure, Samuel's displeasure as well, but God's displeasure with the children of Israel for their selection. God tells us and tells Samuel, this is clearly a rejection of him as their king. Now, if you'll turn with me back quickly to Deuteronomy chapter 17, I want to harmonize this with the idea 
uh, of Deuteronomy chapter 17, which is actually prophetic in nature and tells them um, the rules. Part of the law here given, and Moses gives them the instruction and rules for when they have a future king. Right? We're familiar with these verses, but let's read them. Deuteronomy 17, verse 14. When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shall dwell therein, and shall say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. That's a reminder that God, God knows you, and God knows probably what you're going to do before you do it, right? Um, he knew this. He tells him in verse 15, Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee, Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses. More, for as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart not turn away. Um, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes and do them, that his heart not be lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children, in the midst of Israel. Now, Deuteronomy gives them the rules that they were supposed to have and they were supposed to follow in their selection of a king someday. Don't pick somebody that's going to multiply to himself horses and wives. If you choose a king, he needs to be this kind of man, and he needs to write himself out a copy of this book, and he needs to turn not to the right hand or the left hand, and he needs to be obedient and all those things. If God had already given them instruction for, for how to choose a king and the things that they needed to remember when choosing a king, why does God tell us in 1 Samuel that their desire for a king is a rejection of him? Right? That those, those don't seem to harmonize. Um, but it really does, right? God's will was to be their king. But he did give them preparatory words and laws that were meant to curb the evil that was going to come. Now, you can harmonize those much in the same way. I guess the best explanation or the best comparison would be, you know, when Jesus is teaching there in the New Testament. And they come, and they come to Jesus and they ask him about, divorce, right? And they ask, you know, is, is it lawful to put away your, your spouse for, for any cause? You know, Moses told us, you know, to, to write her a bill of divorcement and, you know, be done with it, right? And Jesus teaches them and tells them, you know, Moses did that because of the hardness of your hearts. He allowed you to do that, but from the beginning it was not so, right? Jesus really teaches them that, that Divorce came into this world. Moses allowed it and put barriers around it, and there's guards around it. But it's not, really, it's not really God's intent, right? That's not really his best way. That is not really his overall will is for us to look at marriage through the eyes of, how can I get out of it if things go wrong? No, no that, that's not the plan. Uh, when the plan goes off course, here's your scenario that, you know, it's got bounds, it's got, you know, it's got a shell, you have to look at it this way. But here's the plan. Well, that, the plan was that God be their king. The plan was that they obey God, that they listen to God, that they be the theocracy that he set up. Should the day come when they rejected that and chose a king, they really, really needed to beware who they chose. Right? If you're going to reject God as being your king and choose your own, that's got disaster written all over it. So let me go ahead and forewarn you, don't pick this kind of guy. Select this kind of person. And here's what that king needs to do, and here's what that king needs to be. But, but don't make the mistake of thinking that uh, Deuteronomy 17 is an endorsement. That's not what that's about. When Israel rejected Samuel and rejected the theocracy, God says it clearly, they've rejected me. 
1 Samuel 12, verse 12, we read, Samuel told him clearly, God was your king and you wanted somebody else. Okay? Now here's Samuel's warning. Let's go back to our text, 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. And let's pick up with verse number 9. Verse number 9. Now therefore hearken unto their voice. Okay? It's obvious that, that, that this is wrong. It's the wrong. It was wrong of them to do this, but God is going to allow them to do it. Right? Now therefore hearken unto their voice. How be it yet protest solemnly unto them and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. Tell you. I'm going to let them do it, but, but Samuel, you got to at least tell them. you got to at least put up a fight. You have to at least tell them and preach to them and let them know how this is going to turn out. The way that this has already started, you know it's going to turn out bad. But you warn them, you tell them. Here's the warning, verse 10. Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that ask of him a king. He said, now this is the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties, and will set them to ear his ground, to reap his harvest, to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. You want a king that's going to lead you in a battle, but rest assured, he's drafting your boys to go to war. He's going to conscript your sons for service. He's going to have your sons fight for you. You want a king that will fight for you. He's going to have your sons fight for him. He's going to conscript them for service, both military, it tells us, and domestic duties. Keep reading there, verse 13. He'll take your daughters to be confectionaries, to be cooks, to be bakers. He will take your fields, your vineyards, your oliveyards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. You think you're unhappy where your tax money goes. Samuel's telling them he's going to take of yours and he's going to give it to his servants. He's going to take the best of your fields, your vineyards, your oliveyards, and he's going to give it to his servants. He's going to take the tenth of the things that you give and it's going to go to him and his. Right? So Samuel is warning them that he's going to take your servant, he's going to take your children, make them his servants, make them serve in his army, make them serve in his house. He's going to take of your money, of your wealth, of your goods, of your land. I, I know you we want a king. There's more to it than that, right? You you haven't thought this thing all the way through. These are the things you're signing up for. If you're just going to spout off, well, we got to have a king. We got to have, we got to be like everybody else. We got to have a king that leads us into battle. Well, guess what? A king needs an army. Where's he going to find it? Your children. What, how's he going to build his house, right? The king lives in a palace. Who serves a king? It's going to be your daughters. And so Samuel's reminding them that the choice of a king does not come without a price. I know it sounds good in theory. Yeah, a king. Somebody to lead us, someone to stand above us, someone to be the focal point. Um, there's more to it than that. So Samuel warns them. Verse 16, he'll take your men servants, your maid servants, your goodliest young men, and your asses, and put them to his work. And he will take the tenth of your sheep, and ye shall be his servants. And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye, which ye shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Now listen, everybody that chooses a leader eventually gets tired of it, right? We know about that in our country, right? Well, you know, vote for this person. Has anybody ever been happy with the person that they voted for when it was all said and done? Not usually, right? Everybody ends up, you know, the people that you put in charge, the people that you put on pedestals, they, it's like they always seem to end up disappointing you. But Samuel's like, that's how this is going to turn out. You think it's great now and you want a king, 
But in verse, seven, verse 18, the day is going to come when you cry out in that day, but it's going to be too late. So Samuel warns them, you want a king, here's the cost. Here's what's coming with it. You're not going to be happy. This is not going to end the way that you want it to end. This is not going to be the end of all your problems. This is not a fix it. This is not a fix all. This doesn't, this doesn't take care of everything. That's the warning. Do you guys remember what happens at the end of the United Kingdom? After Saul and David and Solomon have ruled, what happens to the kingdom? It splits. You remember why it splits? Because the people are tired of being taxed and because the people are tired of the king that won't listen. And it gets to the end when they split the kingdom between Rehoboam and Jeroboam that tw 10 of the tribes say that we have no place. They felt that they had no place in Israel. We'll cover that eventually, but uh, it doesn't end great. Nevertheless, of all the things that I just said, what does verse 19 say? Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye, every man, to his city. There, Samuel is going to concede the, the issue. And he prays, and he talks to the Lord about it, and he relays everything. And God's going to give him a king. When you and I know, just from this text, and we've, we've talked about chapter 8 before, now we've gone through it verse by verse. You and I know that their motives for choosing a king were wrong. All right? This whole, you know, well, we want somebody to, to lead us. You had somebody to lead you. Well, we need somebody to fight for us. God was already doing that. Well, we want to be like all the other nations. But you're not like all the other nations. You're the theocracy, right? God made Israel a peculiar people. When God's people say they want to be like everybody else, they're not like everybody else, right? That's a conflict of interest. That's wrong today, right? When, when, if, if we're Christians and our attitude is, well, I just want to be like everybody else. But you're not like everybody else. You are different. Just, just remember that. So despite the warning, they still want a king. Their motives were wrong. The warning went unheeded. This is not going to end well. Saul's going to do some good things, but Saul is going to, going to end up wasting a, a lot of Israel and a lot of his own personal time in life. Um, but man, they got to have it. And so... The Lord and Samuel, they concede the issue, and they're going to give them a king. Remember that what you want is not always what is best for you. You don't always know that, right? You and I have desires. You and I have wants. You and I are not nearly far-seeing enough or wise enough to always know what is best for us. We have things that we want, but that's why we are encouraged to pray, to seek the Lord, to seek counsel, to seek wisdom. Because there's something worse than not getting what you want. The thing that's worse than not getting what you want is getting what you want when God knew it was bad for you to get it, right? If God knows that it's bad for you, isn't it really better if he doesn't give it to you? No matter how much you fight against that, no matter how much you cry and you whine about it because you really, really, really want it and because we really have desires and the things that we think that we need and we think, man, if I just had this, it'd be the fix-all. Everything would be better if I just had this. Um, and there's times when you don't get that and it feels like the end of the world. Um, remember that 
sometimes no is better than yes if the yes ends up making you miserable. And Saul's going to do that. Keep that in mind, right? When you have desires of your heart, remember to pray like that first church did there in Acts chapter 1, right? When they, when they have decisions to make and they just pray and their prayer is, Lord, thou knowest the hearts of all men. Lord, you know what we're thinking. You know what's in our heart. You know, here we stand ready to choose between two men, and I'm pretty sure everybody knows who they're voting for and who they think they're going to choose to fill Judas's spot. But Lord, uh, here's what we're going to do. But we really, really need you to give wisdom and understanding and, and help. You know our hearts. And listen, the things that we want... Let's run those things by the Lord. And if he says yes, you know, we want God's yes to be to those things that are good for us. That's, that's the best, right? And if God says no, that's better than him saying yes if it's going to result in disaster. Okay, so keep, keep that in mind. Um, listen, we're out of time. Uh, I was going to try to get a couple verses into chapter 9, but let's, let's pick up with that fresh. The first couple verses of chapter 9, now that God has decided, God has said, yep, okay, we'll give him a king. The first two verses of chapter 9 introduce us to the man named Saul. Chapter 9, the first couple verses are going to tell us about him, and we will cover that next time. All right, so chapter 8 is interesting. Everything that they seem to want they had. They had it in the Lord, but that, that wasn't what they wanted, okay? Um, boy, that's an indictment about us sometimes, isn't it? That, that, you know, often we have what we need. We have oftentimes what we say, you know, we want. Um, can we be content with that? If the Lord is everything to us, can we be content with that and Him be enough? I pray that He can. All right.